Hello and welcome to The Lincoln Journey. I'm your host, Grant Veter, and today I will present part three of The Conspirators, the story of the Lincoln assassination. We left off last time as an all-night meeting of the conspirators ended early in the morning of March 16, 1865. The night of Wednesday, March 15th, while Booth, two accomplices, and two innocent young ladies were attending the tragedy of Jane Shore at Ford's Theater, Abraham and Mary Lincoln were at Grover's Theater watching Mozart's The Magic Flute. They were accompanied by Colonel James G. Wilson and Clara Harris, the daughter of New York Senator Ira Harris. A month later, Miss Harris, in company with her stepbrother and later husband, Major Henry Rathbone, was also with the Lincolns the night the president was assassinated. Also on March 15th, Lincoln responded to New York political Thurlow Weed's compliment on his March 4th inaugural address. The president expressed his gratitude and presciently said he thought his speech would survive as well as any of his prior efforts. For the moment, though, he said, I believe it is not immediately popular. The crux of his address was that by the Civil War, God was punishing the whole country for the sin of slavery. If God visited the war on both North and South as the woe due to those by whom the offense of slavery came, as Lincoln put it, then we had to accept that, as he quoted Psalm 19, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Northerners who felt the South bore the full responsibility for slavery, and thus the war, may have taken offense at this sentiment. As Lincoln told Weed, Men are not flattered by being shown that there has been a difference of purpose between the Almighty and them. Booth felt as justified in plotting against the president as the president did in prosecuting America's bloodiest war. But Lincoln was more philosophical about it. In the present Civil War, he wrote to himself years earlier in what became known as his Meditation on the Divine Will, it is quite possible that God's purpose is something different from the purpose of either party. Nothing in the record indicates that Booth, on the other hand, may have believed that God was not entirely on his side. However that may be, we trust that Lincoln got to bed earlier Wednesday night than Booth did. Whether Booth got any sleep after that 5 a.m. adjournment of his meeting of conspirators or not, he was definitely still tired when he went to visit John Matthews on Thursday, March 16th. Matthews was an actor in the Ford Theater Stock Company, and he was staying at William Peterson's house across 10th Street from the theater. When he got home, he found Booth lying on his bed. In a bit of chilling irony, it was the same bed that a month later Abraham Lincoln would die on. Booth had tried to enlist Matthews for his plot, but Matthews had refused and Booth detested him for it. Nevertheless, since Matthews tried to heal the rift between them, Booth maintained relations and used Matthews as a patsy. On this particular day, the relationship proved useful to Booth. With Matthews were two other actors who were talking about their engagement in a charity performance of the play Still Waters Run Deep Friday afternoon at the Campbell Hospital a Union Army medical facility near the route to the soldier's home that Lincoln traveled to daily in the summer months. Despite staying out drinking all night, Booth's mind was clear enough to sense an opportunity that would solve a number of his immediate problems. Oh, to be 26 again. He came up with a plot within a plot, one designed to assure his collaborators that he was sincere about returning to the original kidnap scenario and that would also incriminate them further in a felonious undertaking, making them, especially the now dangerous Arnold, less inclined to rat him out to the authorities. And it would get the all-important guns and other items, including a rope and a monkey wrench, back in his hands. Waiting until Friday afternoon, Booth sent word to Arnold and O'Loughlin to gather the weapons and bring them to H Street, that the moment was at hand. They met the rest of the ring outside Mary Surratt's boarding house, 
where Booth apprised them of the situation and gave them their marching orders. The president, he said, would be attending the play at the hospital out on the outskirts of town. They would be able to closely follow their original plan. He sent Davy Harold to Southern Maryland with the carbines. The rest of them were to hide along 7th Street in order to capture Lincoln's carriage on his return from the play. After overpowering his driver, they would head for Southern Maryland, switch carriages, meet Harold, stop for horses, zigzag through some county roads, and then row the president across the lower Potomac to Virginia. Unfortunately for this plan, Lincoln was not at the play, as Booth well knew. In fact, there's a good chance that Booth saw Lincoln at the National Hotel that afternoon, where Lincoln presented a captured battle flag, as scheduled, to his strong political ally, Indiana Governor Oliver Morton. Booth was living, after all, at the National. Meanwhile, the kidnapped team was supposed to rendezvous at a restaurant on 7th Street before setting out to intercept Lincoln. When Surratt and Atzerodt didn't show, Booth, Arnold, and O'Loughlin set out towards the hospital. At some point, the latter two headed back and Booth proceeded alone. Later, they all found their way to the restaurant. Booth told them the president wasn't there after all and the plan was off. They should all lie low for a while and maybe they could try again in a month or so. Booth would keep the guns. This part of the story is often given as an abortive abduction attempt, but it is more likely that it played out just as Booth planned. He proved his sincerity to his accomplices. He made his accomplices accessories to an attempted kidnapping, and he got his guns and other gear back. Had he already transformed his intention from kidnapping to murder? Quite possibly, but there is no hard evidence of this. Speaking of evidence, what do we know for sure about the involvement of Mary, the Surratt who didn't get away by this point? She owned the boarding house on H Street in Washington, which she ran herself. She also owned the tavern in Surrattsville, a glorified crossroads rather than a town, which she rented to a corpulent and frequently inebriated former police officer, John Lloyd. Both buildings being Confederate safe houses, providing shelter and rendezvous to a steady stream of spies and couriers, it defies credulity that she wouldn't know something about the plotting going on in and around them. However, we have more than circumstantial guesswork to Im implicate her. We have sworn testimony. Can we accept that testimony at face value? Surratt's guilt or innocence and the possible gradations between them have fascinated students of the assassination for approximately 157 years, or said another way, since seven score and 17 years ago. Another boarder at the house on H Street was Louis Weichmann, who knew John Surratt from when they were divinity students together at St. Charles College in Virginia. He was now a clerk at the War Department. Weichmann witnessed much of the Sub Rosa activity at the boarding house. He was aware of John Surratt's work as a Confederate courier, but despite his frequently piqued curiosity about the intentions of Booth and company, he seems never to have been taken into their confidence. Instead, they had him run errands and write mysterious letters, as much to compromise him and keep him mum chance as anything else. He thought they were involved in blockade running, getting much needed foreign supplies past the U.S. Navy and into Confederate ports. Weichmann testified extensively at the trial of the conspirators. On the day that the crew thought they were going to kidnap Lincoln on his return from the play at the Campbell Hospital, Weichmann had seen John Surratt ride off with Booth and the others. None of them explained their purpose to him, so he decided to ask Mrs. Surratt. He found her weeping. John has gone away, she sobbed. She told him he would need to prepare his own dinner and then retreated to her room. The implication here is that Mary knew that a kidnapping plan was afoot. That is not the only possible explanation for her behavior, but it fits into a pattern that led to her being a defendant in the murder trial. We'll put a pin in it for now. On March 18th, the day after the conspirators didn't abduct Lincoln on the 7th Street Turnpike, they remembered that they had left Davy Harrell in Southern Maryland with the guns. Surratt and Atzerodt 
went in search of him and met him on the road south of Surrattsville. He had the weapons, which at this point included, according to the bartender at the tavern where Harold spent the previous night, two shotguns, two carbines, a revolver, and a dagger. Returning to the tavern at Surrattsville, Surratt told tavern keeper Lloyd he wanted to hide the Spencer repeating carbines there. On the second story, the floor of the room over the kitchen was two feet lower than the floor of the room over the dining room. Where the rooms met, he shoved the carbines between the exposed joists over the dining room. He told Lloyd he would be back for the guns in a few days. Booth, meanwhile, had an engagement that night at Forge Theater. He had the lead in The Apostate, a play in which a tyrant is killed and then the assassin commits suicide. It played to a full house. All the conspirators still in town attended, as did Louis Weichmann. It was Booth's final stage appearance in a role not of his own devising. Two days later, Arnold and O'Loughlin checked out of their boarding house and returned to Baltimore. Arnold's deadline that the act be accomplished by the end of the prior week had passed, and he considered his obligation concluded. Arnold later claimed that the general idea of the entire party was that the project was entirely abandoned. However, five days later, Booth stopped in Baltimore to find Sam and Mike on his way back to Washington from New York. He was in New York for the last night of Brother Edwin's famous Hundred Nights Hamlet, in which he played Hamlet 100 nights in a row, in which he had begun the day after the three Booth brothers played Julius Caesar together the previous November. In Baltimore, Booth stopped at Arnold's father's house, and since Arnold wasn't there, he left a letter asking that they meet at the Barnum Hotel, a notorious rebel hangout. In due time, Arnold went there, but Booth was gone. Frustrated and defensive, Arnold penned a response and sent it to Booth in Washington. In it, he said that his family thought he was acting suspiciously, and he had assured them that he was done with Booth. He felt the walls were closing in. You know full well that the government suspicions something is going on there, he wrote Booth. Therefore, the undertaking is becoming more complicated. Time more propitious will arrive yet. Do not act rashly or in haste. Since this letter was found in the trunk Booth left in his hotel room after he fled Ford's Theater, it was one that Arnold would have several tortuous years to regret. In spite of his resolution to steer clear of Booth and his dangerous machinations, Arnold was drawn to him again, this time in order to assist his friend Michael Lachlan. Mike visited Sam on March 31st, and they commiserated over their shared apprehensions of Booth's scheme. But Booth owed O'Loughlin $500, and the latter felt he would have a better chance to collect it if Arnold went with him to see the actor. They left for Washington immediately, and when they arrived at the D.C. train depot, whom should they see but George Port Tobacco Atzerodt? He gave them the astonishing news that Lincoln was to be at Ford's that night, and the plan to pick him up there was a go. Horror struck, they rushed to Booth's room at the National Hotel to talk him out of it. But it was a false alarm. Lincoln wasn't even in town. Anticipating that the end of the war was near, he was visiting the Army in Virginia. Furthermore, Booth took a huge load off their minds by telling them that he was abandoning the plot. They asked what they should do with the pistols Booth had given them. Keep them, sell them, do whatever you want with them, he said. He was going to return to his profession and once again tread the boards. Arnold asked him to destroy his very incriminating letter. Booth said he would, but it was too valuable of an insurance policy. Booth left the letter in his trunk. In an alternate universe, we heave a gargantuan sigh of relief and thank our lucky stars that Abraham Lincoln, savior of the Union and emancipator of the slaves, so narrowly missed assassination. But in this universe, we do no such thing. That's the end of part three. If you have questions or comments, contact me at grantveter at gmail.com. We'll see you next time on part four of The Conspirators.